you for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. And I think you're going to share my slides with me. Yes. Um, this is a very exciting time in headache and migraine specifically and also cluster um, because finally, after so many years, we have so many good new therapies available. And the possibility of these new therapies means that we're understanding a lot more about uh, migraine as a disease um, and not only uh, the negative aspects of migraine, but the pathophysiology so that we can develop new uh, options for patients. And some of them are to do with medicine and some of them are not. And so for me, what that's looked like in the past year has been seeing patients have outcomes that we haven't been able to see before, um, but also offering hope because every day that goes by, there's more research being done and more attention being given to migraine. And it's so important that miles for migraine and other such events occur to bring attention to headache. Um, and, you know, I came here because my dad was a headache doctor. I was never, by the way, going to be a headache doctor like my dad. And you can see what happened. Um, and sadly, we lost him last October, almost a year ago. And uh, there isn't a day goes by that I don't miss him and just his input. He was a ferocious clinician. He fought for patients' rights. He, he really, uh, he stuck his neck out there when nobody was really doing headache work and made uh, headache important uh, so that those of us that came behind him could do the jobs we needed to do. Oh, so, so you followed in his footsteps. Hmm? You followed in his footsteps. I did follow in his footsteps, finally. Wow. Finally. Well, I just <laughs> wanted to, to remind everyone one minute. To, if everyone could make sure you mute your um, mute yourself, that would be great. So thank, thank you very much. Go ahead. And thank you. So if you can flip to the first slide, um, there's some science here, but I think it's important. And I think it's super important because as... Uh, patients, as clinicians, we want to be able to bring information. So while some of these drawings look very complicated, I think the bottom line in talking about it is that migraine obviously is a, is a, a nervous system disorder. A good way to think about a migraine brain is that it's hyper irritable. And now we can identify much more clearly uh, the different uh, uh, agents, the different neuro neurotransmitters and neuropeptides that play such an important role in uh, the symptoms of a patient's headaches, their migraines. And a lot of this is work done by Peter Goadsby, um, who's a researcher and the current president, I believe, of the American Headache Society, um, even though he's not American. And he did some really fascinating uh, studies some years ago where he actually drew the blood from the main vein that comes out of the brain, the jugular vein, uh, in patients who are having migraine attacks. And he was able to isolate uh, a bunch of different neuroinflammatory peptides. Um, and then using that information was able to identify the ones he, that appeared to be very causative, not only in initiating migraine and starting a migraine attack, but also in perpetuating sending the pain message. And that's sort of how we got to CGRP, which is sort of the buzzword in the last two years uh, in terms of what we're looking at with our newer medications, most of them. And, uh, and so CGRP, uh, it's important to remember that it is a very strong vasodilator and neuroinflammatory compound. And if I gave you an intravenous uh, uh, a mixture of CGRP, I could induce a pretty bad migraine in you if you have migraine. Um, and so it became important to look at different ways to block CGRP. And CGRP isn't only something that causes inflammation and vasodilatation, it also uh, transmits the pain message. So if you go to kind of the stem area of the top drawing, you can see the brain stem, which is sort of what I call the computer control system. And then if CGRP is unchecked, it goes up into the higher cortical structures. So I think the important thing here is into 
learn about, about a lot about neuroanatomy, but to understand that uh, migraine be begins in the brainstem and then spreads to the cerebral cortex to sort of the processing part of your brain. And that CGRP is there all the way. It's there from the initiation of migraine. It's there in the uh, trigeminal vascular system, our fifth cranial nerve, which transmits pain. Um, and also is present in higher uh, cerebral centers. So CGRP uh, is super important and many of our new medications and tools have a lot to do with CGRP. Next slide. I think. So this is a little complicated, less complicated than the last one, but I put this slide in here because it kind of tells us where stuff works. So on the top is your trigeminal nerve, which is that fifth cranial nerve I was talking about. And on the left side of the drawing, you can see the triptans. And those are our 5-HT1B and 1D receptor agonists, our drugs of, uh, are the triptans, which became available in the 1990s. And this is where they work at that trigeminal nerve. Um, and so they block uh, uh, that vasodilatation and inflammation. Um, once that gets into action, what happens is that trigeminal nerve releases CGRP. Those are all the little blue balls running around. Um, and the CGRP, again, causes vasodilatation and inflammation in the blood vessels that surround your scalp, uh, your meningeal blood vessels. And then CGRP binds to the trigeminal nerve and transmits the pain message. And so where do our new preventative medications work? Our new preventative medications work by blocking that CGRP receptor or by vacuuming up the CGRP. So I liken what the antibodies do, uh, the antibody that blocks the, the receptor it's kind of like having a key and a keyhole and that antibody blocks the keyhole. It's like putting clay in the keyhole. And the other thing that the other antibodies do, and we'll talk about them a little more specifically in a minute, is that they actually vacuum up CGRP so it's not available to send that pain message. Um, and so this is a little bit of a simplistic way to look at it. Um, but it's also very informative because what you're doing is you're trying to disrupt the transmission of the pain message. And, and we never had this much detail and we never had this much information about how our medicines work. If we go back to think about all the other preventative medications that we've been using in migraine for the last 30 years, uh, we found out they worked by accident. Uh, we had patients come back into the office when they were put on beta blockers like Indorol or Propranolol and tell their doctors that they didn't have their bad migraines anymore. So it was sort of more by accident that we found out that stuff. If we can go to the next slide. Hmm. Not working? No. Sorry, one more time. Oh. Oh, it's, it's doing the little, there we go. There you go. So, so here's the cool thing. Um, I always think it's good to visualize. So that picture on the right-hand side, which is both of a monoclonal antibody and then a G pant. So you can see that that monoclonal antibody is really big. Uh, it has, I like to call it two Mickey Mouse ears and then a, a, a main body portion. The main body portion, uh, keeps the molecule stable, and the two ears bind the CGRP or block the receptor, depending what they're doing. The cool thing about monoclonal antibodies is that they're targeted therapies. So we believe that's why these drugs can be very, very tolerable for our patients. They don't have very many side effects. Doesn't mean they have none, but they have very few. And the other piece is because they're monoclonal antibodies, your kidneys and your liver don't process, that, process them. What actually happens is your white blood cells uh, uh, notice when they're getting old and they uh, phagocytize them, which means they, they absorb them, and then they take them apart and reuse the parts. So they're 
great uh, recyclers in your body <laughs> from the little other pieces. Um, and these drugs work by preventing the transmission of that pain message by CGRP. G pants, which currently are available only as acute medicine, something to take when you get a migraine. Um, and those drugs are much, much smaller. They're more our traditional molecules. And what they do is they block that CGRP receptor. So very, very important, tons of information, uh, really, and, and I think super important because when you go to talk to your uh, healthcare provider about this stuff, it's always good to have information in your pocket to share with your uh, provider. Next slide. Hopefully. Okay, so uh, these are the four current monoclonal antibodies available to prevent migraine. Uh, one is called arenumab, and that's Amavig, and that is the only one that blocks the receptor. The next one is Fremenazumab or Ajovi, and that one vacuums up CGRP or binds all the extra CGRP. Galconazumab is Mgality, which also is a vacuum cleaner. And eftinazumab is an intravenous uh, compound, which also uh, binds up CGRP. So one works at the receptor, the other three work at uh, uh, binding up CGRP. Um, and the intravenous one, eftinazumab or VIFD, has only become available this year, uh, I think, first in uh, late February, early March, um, and is currently uh, is available. It is the only intravenous one. Um, so again, in the last two years, you can see our, our marketplace in terms of new preventative medications has really exploded for patients. Um, and these drugs, as opposed to prior medications, are incredibly target specific. So I was supposed to talk about today, you know, how does that change, how does that change the environment for the patient? How, how do we use these medications and who should use these medications and, um, you know, who's appropriate for, for treatment with one of these drugs? And the answer is, um, that they have really changed the face of preventive treatment in migraine today in the sense that we can offer patients very specific therapies uh, that work uh, in a very targeted way with very few side effects. Um, there are certain patients that probably aren't the best candidates for these medications. Um, migraine, as everybody's aware, is a female preferative disorder you know, it likes women a little bit more than men. And so it's about 20% of the female population in the United States and about eight per seven or 8% of the male population in the United States. And, and one of the things we have to consider is that we don't really have any pregnancy or lactation or breastfeeding data on these medications. And so it's really important in that population to obviously talk to them about what their childbearing uh, future might hold for them um, just to be safe because we don't know if these medications are safe in pregnancy or breastfeeding and it takes a while for them to clear your system. So in general that is a population we don't use them in. Uh, they really have uh, uh, helped patients in, in ways we haven't seen. I've seen patients uh, for the first time in my practice, really have much more meaningful headache-free days, uh, which is um, which is very important. Um, people always say, "What's your favorite one? What works the best?" And I like to say the one that works best for you because they all can work incredibly well. Uh, clearly, uh, Viepti or Eptimazumab because it is intravenous um, is probably quicker to onset. Um, and certainly has some good uh, outcomes in clinical trials. Um, and, and so the biggest, the biggest burden, I think, as a provider and also patients carry is patient preference and also what insurers will bear the cost of. 
And so what I will share with you is uh, we're much better at getting these medications approved today than we were two years ago. Um, my hope is one day that patients don't have to jump through other hoops to get to them. So currently some insurers are saying you have to try two other mainstream preventative drugs before we get to these, which I find sort of crazy because these were the first drugs made for migraine. Um, and that's a political issue we're gonna have to keep fighting that battle for. Next slide. Um, so the three big questions about MAB MABs, we like to call them MABs, is number one, are they safe? Um, uh, two, are they different than what we have now? And last but not least, are they an improvement? So the first question, are they safe? Uh, I'm going to share with you that we now have, we're going on six and seven years of patients having utilized these drugs not only once they were approved, but prior to approval. And nothing terribly dangerous has come out of them. There are certainly uh, uh, side effects that have occurred that weren't listed in the label. There has been some significant allergies. Uh, Amavig or Renumab has a warning for constipation um, and also for uh, potentially for high blood pressure. And so, um, Certainly because there are three other ones that don't have those warnings, we can always shift if we see that that might be a problem for that particular patient. The second question is, are they different than what we have now? And the answer is yes, because they're far more specific um, and seem to have a much cleaner uh, preventative profile. In saying that, I have several patients who prefer to stick with what they're on. They feel it's working well for them and they want more information and more time before they'll utilize something new. Um, and are they an improvement? Uh, for many of my patients, they have been an improvement. Um, and, and so one of, the, one of the questions is, does that mean I cannot take any other medicine or never have a migraine again? And the answer is no, that's not true. They're not, they're not a cure, uh, but they do give patients better outcome. They do give patients less disability. Um, and more important than that, and I think we haven't proved it yet, I think they change uh, a migraineur's brain in the sense of they don't just help reduce the number of migraines, but they also seem to improve what I call that interictal burden, which in English means the migraine hangover, the recovery time, the ability to do your next thing uh, when you've treated a migraine. And I do believe in the next few years, we'll be actually able to show that as well. So let's go to the next slide. So we also have small molecule CGRP receptor antagonists, and these are called GPANs. I don't make up these names. Uh, uh, um, but as you can see in the generic formulation, there's a GPANT in all of them. Um, these drugs currently that are available are available for acute therapy. The reason they're here as prevention is because there are some GPANs being developed uh, for prevention. And for that patient who doesn't want to use an injection because the monoclonal antibodies are only injectable, this might be an appropriate option. For the patient who's thinking about pregnancy, this might be a better option. Not because I want you to take it as you're trying to get pregnant, because we still don't have enough information to say that's okay, but they get out of your system quicker, quicker than a monoclonal antibody. So if you decide six weeks from now you want to start to try to have a baby, there's no harm in using that drug till right before you start to conceive. Um, the two drugs in that category are Atojapant, um, which is now uh, soon going to be put before the FDA uh, for prevention. And, um, and the second one is Romijapant, which is already approved for acute therapy as Nurtec. Um, and so uh, these will be interesting molecules, which will come to fruition probably within the next year or two. And so very exciting because we have another mechanism of getting CGRP effective blockade um, in a form 
formulation that's oral as opposed to uh, subcutaneous. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, so we're gonna talk about new acute medicines and we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so there are a lot uh, of new formulations available and I think this builds, yeah. So first of all, we're gonna look at kind of the old guys uh, that are in new formulations. So um, these are FDA approved currently and available. The first is on Zetra, which is a sumatriptan powder that's nasally inhaled. It's sort of an interesting and uh, weird device that does work well. One of the negatives with traditional sumatriptan nasal spray was that it tasted terrible. Um, and so Anzetra takes that piece away. The second is Zembrace, which is your sumatriptan injectable at a three milligram dose. Um, it's still super important for patients who have terrible nausea and vomiting with their headaches or wake up with their migraines. And then last but not least, Tosimra, which is a sumatriptan nasal spray uh, with an enhancement in it so it doesn't taste like gasoline when you take a dose. So those are all approved and in the marketplace today. Uh, next slide. Uh, other ones in development um, include Qtripta, which is a Zomatriptan, our old Zomeg, in a, uh, a, a tiny little patch with micro needles, which should be committed uh, it should be approved by the FDA in the near future. Uh, there is a DHE nasal spray with a propellant coming out um, and another one with a powder. So DHE, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is an old product back from the 1940s, uh, even before I was born, and um, comes in a nasal spray. But the and also comes injectably, and we use it in our inpatient setting quite a bit. Um, and some of my patients will inject at home. The negative with DHG nasal spray has always been its delivery system. And so with these two new options, it should be a nice uh, addition to patients' toolkits um, in terms of what they can use uh, for treatment. Next slide. Um, and then, Last, the last couple we have are already approved. The first one is lasmitidan or Ravow. So Ravow is a 5-HT1F receptor agonist. And we know about 1B and 1D receptor agonists. Those are our triptans. 1F works at an entirely different receptor. Um, it does act centrally as well. So there is a warning not to drive with this medication kind of feels like you had a beer or two, so you feel okay and think you can do it, but we don't want you to operate heavy machinery. Uh, effective orally, um, good pain freedom. Um, and actually, I, I've often spoken about this drug being a nice drug to have in COVID because we're not driving a lot of places, we're at home. And the other thing that I needed to be reminded by my patients, but is super important, is that a lot of patients don't feel comfortable driving with their migraines anyway. And so this is a very good acute medicine uh, with the correlation that we don't want you to use it if you're gonna have to operate your car or other such machinery. And also we uh, would like, uh, uh, it, it is scheduled, it's kind of like gabapentin or Neurontin. So uh, it, it potentially could lead to liking of the medication. So far, I haven't seen it uh, be a problem, but it is something to be aware of. Next slide. Um, and then we have our G pants. Right now, we have Ubrojaprant, which is Ubrelvi, and Remigipant, which is Neurotech, uh, available orally. Um, and these are both acute uh, 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 medications for migraine. They are an option other than a triptan. So while triptans work amazingly well, um, and I love them and I'm so glad we've had them. Uh, there are some uh, associated side effects that patients don't like, that tight choky feeling, um, and they are sometimes prone to medication overuse. And so it's great to have other tools in the tool chest that work uh, well. These drugs have a good half-life. 
uh, Remitropant lasts a bit longer than Ubrotropant, but they're both good new acute medicines and they're in that GPant family. So we'll go to the next one before I run out of time. At least talk too long. Um, safety and tolerability, both of the GPants work really, really well. Occasionally some nausea, sometimes a little sleepiness. The good news is the early GPants cause some liver toxicity and these drugs do not. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so let's talk about uh, non-medication therapies or neuromodulation and we'll go to the next slide. That looks really peaceful and nice. Um, so these are the three approved neuromodulators or neurostimulators for migraine. The first one was cephaly, which came out some years ago, uh, initially sort of like a headband and now like a Leia princess thing on your forehead. Um, there's also the e, uh, STMS or transcranial magnetic stimulator and then gamma core. And I have to put a little aside in here because right now that STMS is not available uh, nor is the gamma core. So uh, both of those have been shown to be able to help both acutely and preventatively, um, but are not available uh, today. Uh, 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 businesses, I think, went belly up. Hopefully they'll come back because I have some patients who have done really, really well on those type of modulators. And this is a great device for people who don't like taking uh, oral medication. Um, it also uh, can work in, a, in, in other places as well. There is also uh, an FDA approved uh, remote neuromodulator called Norevio. It sort of looks like a very thin blood pressure cuff uh, you put on your arm. And again, neuromodulation. And the whole concept of neuromodulation is you're feeding a lot of stimulation to your central nervous system and it sort of extincts out the pain signals. Um, these have been used for many, many years and now uh, some of these devices are available. Currently the Norevio is available um, and, and useful. And then last but not least, there are uh, supra, uh, supraorbital and occipital transcutaneous uh, stimulators as well, and those have been um, uh, approved um, or in development right now. We'll go to the next slide. Sorry, I went too slow. Um, and this just shows where these different devices we believe work um, um, by blocking, by overstimulating that nervous system so it sort of blocks the signals from coming in. Uh, these di devices are costly, and so one of the biggest challenges for my patients and for me recommending them for my patients has been cost, which has been a, a, sig a significant block for my patients. I just want to add one more device that um, I forgot to put in my slide, so my apologies. Uh, there is a green light wavelength. So Rami Burstein, who's one of the most brilliant migraine researchers in the world, I think probably the most, um, uh, uh, always is trying to tease out the different areas in migraine where things occur to help us to decide about different treatments. And Rami and his team at Harvard came out with a very specific green light wavelength um, and it, it, first of all, it has been super effective for my patients uh, who have terrible photophobia, light sensitivity. It also can improve sort of your mood and relaxing you. And I have a lot of my uh, students using it who have to be on the computer a lot. And certainly with COVID, it's been a nice device for my patients who, um, who, who really have light sensitivity and computer issues. I believe the device is called Allay, A-L-L-A-Y, and it's a one-time cost. So it's not something that's super expensive, um, but it has been very uh, uh, useful for some of my patients. And then, next slide, I think we're almost done, uh, is that's it. Um, if you have any questions, please query us. We're at the diamondheadacheclinic.com, www.diamondheadacheclinic.com. Also National Headache Foundation, 
miles for migraines, so many good uh, places for patients to get good information and to hopefully access good treatment for their headaches. And I wanna thank you for your time today. And do we have time for questions or how does this work now? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now I need to check out the chat and see questions for you. Um, let me see. Okay. If a patient doesn't respond to one of the peptide drugs, um, does that mean they won't respond to the others? No, they can respond to, yeah, that's really interesting. Certainly the, you know, your gut is if, if I haven't responded to say I'm Galati or a Jovi because their receptor, they, because they bind to the ligand as opposed to the receptor, you know, your gut is to go with the receptor or aim of it. Um, and certainly we do that, but I have patients individually who have done well on one of the ligands and not another. And the reason I know that is because sometimes patients are forced to switch because of insurance issues. Like the insurer doesn't understand how traumatic it is for a patient who's finally found a decent therapy. But what well, we think you should do this instead. Um, and, uh, and so sometimes the patient has to prove that that second therapy does not work as well, um, which is not good. So the answer is yes, you can respond to a different ligand receptor. And Viepti or eptamazumab is probably the prime example. There are patients who get reasonable responses from the ligands, but not quite enough. And so we'll move them to the IV one sometimes, and that might do the trick. Okay, great, thank you. Um, will any of the CGRPs be approved for daily preventative medications? Are you talking about, maybe this is about G pants? Um, the CG, CGRP, yeah. yeah, the CGRPs are already approved for prevention, uh, the monoclonal antibodies. The G pants, both the Tojapant and Remigipant, will probably be approved in the next year or so, okay. I would say. Okay, great, thank you very much. And um, are there less side effects with the Zumatriptan nasal spray? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, both of the nasal powered devices seem to be better tolerated. Um, and, you know, if Zumatriptan is a drug that gives you those really intolerable chest or tight feelings, it will be lessened in the nasal sprays, but not necessarily entirely gone. Okay, great, thank you. Will you be able to use oral G pants as a preventative in a combination with an injectable anti-CRGB or will you have to choose one? That's a great question and we don't know. So here's what I will tell you. There are patients on monoclonal antibodies, you know, Amovig, Amgality, Biopsy, Adobe, who take G pants for acute therapy. There's no harm in that. We've been able to show that. So the question is, would you take both to prevent more? And I'm gonna say, we don't know yet. Okay. We don't know yet. That is a very true and honest answer. Would, um, would Rayval be a bad option to try if you're also taking Neurotin? No, so, and I'm sorry, I wasn't clear enough about that. When they, so if you, so currently, if the FDA is going to approve a drug that causes central nervous system issues, one of the questions they wanna know, which is good, is is there a potential for abuse? So what the people at Lilly did which I thought was pretty brave, but pretty smart, was they gave uh, people who were polysubstance drug uh, overutilizers, people who had substance issues, 400 milligrams, which is twice the max of what you normally would. And they asked them, do you like the drug? And it had a likability factor, which is why it is scheduled, um, but it is a schedule five. So yes, you can use it with gabapentin, but when you're comparing likability, it's likability like gabapentin likability, like some patients might overutilize gabapentin. So I think, that, like, 
what I would tell you and the way I look at it as a clinician is if I have a patient who has substance issues or I have a patient who's sober um, and working a program, it is in my it is my job to say, guess what? This drug can alter you a little bit. And is that something you can use safely? Okay. It is not likable like codeine. It is not likable like uh, Ativan. It is not likable like Pelvitol or, you know, a barbiturate compound, but it does have a little bit of likability. So, you know, I'm pretty honest with my patients and I screen people to see if they would be an appropriate patient for this drug. And I am careful with it. I have not seen any problems because I am hoping that asking those questions helps me to select the right patient. Right. And gabapentin is a likable medication? It is. They didn't, you know, but, so what I'm going to say, so what I'm going to say is gabapentin is now scheduled as well. So if I have to write a, a prescription for gabapentin, I go through that process of going through uh, the electronic medical record verification that that's a scheduled substance. And it's not an opioid, right? It is not, but, but there is some potential for overuse and that's why they're being careful. I mean, it's actually a good thing. Um, again, it might be overkill with gabapentin and it might be a little overkill with Revo, um or lesmitidan, but I, I just think with where we are with the opiate crisis and, and not asking the right questions, that it's so important to ask those questions. I, right. I really do. I think it's for patient safety and in the end, we'll do a better job as clinicians. Right, may as well ask too many questions, right? But not enough. And be annoying sometimes, but yes. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, okay, I think we have, um, we did put on the, um, the chat, the ally lamp is on there, and that okay. is the name of the green light. Um, yeah. We have uh, discussed that in a bunch of our support groups, and we okay. have gotten a lot of great feedback as well. Um, yeah, so, I think it's, I think it's yeah. really helping. Um, there is one more question, which I believe the answer is no, but I want to double check. Does insurance cover any of the, the devices? No, and that's been the problem. Like we know, for example, that uh, a couple of them work quite well for patients, mm -hmm. but many patients, so there's the cost of the device itself and then there's the cost of the refills. Right. right. And that can run many hundreds of dollars every month. And so it's almost frustrating as a provider. I know that that can be helpful, but getting access to it for our patients has been really, really difficult. Right. Yeah, so um, that's it with the questions. We really appreciated it and um, enjoyed your slides a lot. Thank you. I know they were busy and complicated, but I think it's kind of cool and everybody needs to know kind of how this stuff is working. Very cool. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. Bye, everybody. Have a good day.